Week three of NFL preseason, the final week before regular season. We've got 10 days till kickoff. 10 days for the rest of our lives. Week three, preseason in the books. We're going game by game, recapping the biggest ranking changes for fantasy football based on the little preseason action that we did see. Another week of a lot of starters ending up resting in this one, taking a nap during the game, hitting the bench, hitting the pine tar. It is what it is, but there are takeaways here, okay? There are takeaways and all of the updates, preseason week three recaps, game by game, in-depth snap counts, all that kind of shit is in the draft guide available right now. All the rankings have been completely updated and sent out to y'all. And if for some reason you have not gotten the updates, you can email us, business at bdge.co. But please check your spam folder first. Let's get it. Thought I wasn't going to tuck my shirt in. No, no, no. First game, the Pittsburgh Steelers and Kenny Pickles versus my Atlanta Falcons. If you can guess who that is based on that signature, I'm going to give you a free draft guide. So first off, Kenny Pickett, man, he's having quite a summer. You know, all of the the chirpings out of Pittsburgh were that he took the next step. And uh, by all accounts, this is one of the most electric summers we've seen out of a second-year quarterback. He looks incredible. I love that they're letting him get extended run. I love that they're letting him stay onto the field with the starters, getting multiple series per preseason game. Now, I'll say a few things. This game, he was, if you guys didn't watch the game, he was just throwing fucking seeds around like a goddamn farmer. Deontay Johnson, two plays later, George Pickens, like beautiful 30, 40, 45 yard shots down the field, dimes. And I get it. They were against the backup. They were against the backup defense for the Atlanta Falcons, who is pretty much a backup defense to begin with. So let's not get crazy here, but those throws that he made, would have dropped against all pro defenders. They were they were that good. So my biggest takeaway is Kenny Pickett absolutely on the verge of a year two breakout. I'm not, you know, he's not going to be like a top 12 QB for me in my rankings or anything. I think I have him solidified as like a QB 18, 19 in that range. So like a solid QB two with some upside, but again, preseason. So we don't want to get crazy with it. I will say though, their offense is, is solidified at this point. We know it's Deontay Johnson and George Pickens. So if I've been drafting those two, I feel pretty good based on what we've seen out of Kenny Pickett so far. Allen Robinson is the clear three. He's playing that big slot role. And then the split between Najee and Jalen Warren is very, very real. Najee is yet to play three consecutive snaps in a preseason game. He comes in for two. Jalen Warren comes in. He comes in for two. Jalen Warren comes in. Jalen Warren is playing in all of the obvious passing down situations, and he's going to be their two and four minute drill back. That is... That is massive. That's big information to take away from this. So unbiasedly, however, you know, if we think Kenny Pickett's going to take a big step forward with this offense and we think the offense overall is going to be better, that Najee Harris is going to get a lot of goal line opportunities should also be included in that. I will just say, like, listen, he started off at the end of the third round as a pick. We weren't there with him. Fourth round, still not really there with him. Jalen Warren looks fantastic. This is going to be a split backfield. Najee will get a ton of early down work. He'll probably get the goal line work. I think they'll both be usable for fantasy, but using an early round pick on Najee, like a really, really high value draft capital pick on Najee when you have these like second tier or second year, like high upside wide receiver breakout candidates available, usually where you can get Najee. We're going to pivot off him. But Jalen Warren, fantastic late-round pick. Atlanta rested all of their fantasy-relevant players. Let's move over to Indy and Philly. Philly rested all their uh, fantasy-relevant players. In Indy, we got to see an extended uh, extended game out of Anthony Richardson, which is cool. I'm not – still, I don't care what we've seen so far. I'm not in on him at his QB10 price in fantasy drafts right now. His performances, along with this one, have been – what he's billed as, right? He's got some really, really awesome like highlight play throws. He's had some good throws where receivers drop balls. He's had some really bad throws where he continuously like overthrows his receivers. This game was big because we saw him use his legs. He ran for 38 rushing yards in the first half. 3.8 fantasy points right there in the first half. I will say, though, despite that, at the end of the first half, he had 6.9 fantasy points total. Okay, so over two halves, that's Less than 14 fans, you're talking about 13.8 fantasy points. So him having 75 yards on the ground, but performing the way he did through the air is the reason why I'm still extremely hesitant to draft him. So you might say, oh, he's got such a high floor. It's like, he'll, he's going to have a lot of bad games. He's going to go through growing pains. He's really, really young. He's really, really raw. He's really high upside and has a lot of exciting future games to be played. But I'm not there with him right now when you have the Daniel Joneses, the Kirk Cousins, the Dak Prescotts going after him. I'll take those guys over him every single time. Alec Pierce, though, is one of my favorite double-digit round targets right now. It is so clear what his role. He just continues to get peppered with downfield targets. They are He's like Christian Watson light with Anthony Richardson, Jordan Love, Christian Watson, 
is Anthony Richardson, Alec Pierce, for the most part. They're going to connect eventually, and they're going to have some really, really big games. On that point, Michael Pittman's really uninspiring. He just seems to get a ton of low-volume targets again. I'm just repeating myself week after week because the same things keep happening. I keep finding myself passing on Michael Pittman, even when you're in that point of the draft where it's like, oh, this feels like good value for him, kind of out on him. Detroit, Carolina. Uh, Detroit rested all of their fantasy-relevant players. Carolina, we did get to see 22 snaps out of Bryce Young. And this was, without a doubt, his best performance so far. We saw, like, the elusiveness, the poise, the accuracy, the playmaking ability in the pocket that got him that first overall pick. Now, he's still not a target for me in fantasy by any metric. He's like a, a desperate QB3 in Superflex League. And we're still kind of trying to figure out this receiving core because DJ Chark is out with a hamstring. LaVisca Chenault's in con concussion protocol. Uh, Terrace Marshall's dealing with a back injury. But... Of the 22 snaps, we saw Jonathan Mingo play all 22, 100% of the snaps for Mingo. So he is a target of mine. Adam Thielen looked like he's getting a lot of chemistry going with Bryce Young right now and could end up being like the favorite veteran target there. I'm still hesitant to, to feel confident that he's really going to last a full year because you have all these youthful players, right? Marshall, Chark, LaVisca, all young and are like on the heels of being playmakers for Bryce Young. So I don't really know how this is going to play itself out. I'm not really... Drafting Thielen, I do like Jonathan Mingo. You get a huge discount on DJ Chark now with the hamstring injury, so I'm okay getting him super late too, but Mingo would be my target in the passing game here. New England, Tennessee, the fourth game of the weekend. New England rested all their players. Tennessee rested all their players as well. Chargers, San Francisco. So the Chargers rested all their players too, but Quentin Johnson played the full slate of snaps, which has been the case week after week after week in the preseason. What makes me feel as if he is the outside looking in as it relates to the starting teams. You'll have Keenan, you'll have Mike Williams, and likely Joshua Palmer. Does he take over the starting spot? I'm sure he does so at some point of the year, but I do think that needs to be factored into the draft capital when he's going in the same spots as the other rookies like Zay Jones and Jordan Addison, who are almost for sure week one, day one starters in their respective offenses. So I'll move Johnson down a tick. And as I said before, if you want to get a hold of all the week three recap write-ups, as well as full rankings for super flex, one quarterback, positional rankings, must draft players, all fade lists. Basically, you don't have to do any more research because this is all perfectly nicely laid out for you in our draft guide, which you can get in one of two ways. You can get it full price, $25 on our store, bdge.shop, or for a discounted price by going through our partners, Underdog Fantasy. Download the app or go to the website, underdogfantasy.com. And when you deposit $10 or more, so you're getting it for $10 instead of $25, and they're going to double whatever you throw down onto the platform using our code BDGE. So go to Underdog Fantasy, download the app, type in BDGE. When you deposit $10 or more for the first time, they're going to double it as well as email you out our draft guide for free for doing it. So a whole lot of value for a whole little bit of price. The rankings are up there. Quentin Johnson moved his ass down. Now, one of the more interesting storylines of the preseason, in my opinion, is trying to figure out who is getting scraps behind Austin Eckler. Speaking of, I actually just had a fantasy draft last night with Austin Eckler. I never thought I would find myself saying in the entirety of my life that Austin Eckler fucking sniped me on a pick. He was like three picks before me, really wanted Dallas Goddard, Austin Eckler. I guess him and Dallas have a good relationship or he thinks he's going to be good. Maybe Austin Eckler really is about the fantasy life. He's very active in the community. Weirdly, don't ask me how I'm in a fucking league with him, but he sniped me on Dallas Goddard. I don't know if I'll ever forgive him, but I will forgive him if he he's way to Joshua Kelly, who I've been drafting a lot of shares of in best ball drafts. Now, again, Herbert didn't play, but... With the starters, Josh Kelly got five snaps. Isaiah Spiller got seven snaps. It does feel like they're going to be a committee if Eckler were to go down. But if Eckler's not going down, they want a second running back there. Um, and although Spiller outsnapped Kelly, Kelly did show some explosion, which might be the tiebreaker there. He ripped off a 75-yard touchdown run in this one. Kelly's like, he's an extremely like underwhelming player overall. But coming out, he was a pretty good athlete. Like for his size, his weight adjusted speed, he ran a good 40. And if that can, like, jump him in the depth chart there, he could be kind of valuable as a 17th, 18th round pick in your fantasy draft. So those are my kind of big takeaways from the Chargers. Other side of the ball, Brock Purdy did play 19 snaps in this one. He wasn't really asked to do much, but what he was asked to do, he was perfect doing it. He was on target with everything. Debo and Brandon Ayuk, 100% of the snaps with Purdy. Juwan Jennings seems to be the wide receiver three in this offense, though I don't know what that really amounts to. All I know is I'm just trying to draft Brandon Ayuk fucking everywhere. Buffalo at Chicago. So I come to you humbly, and I, I've already twisted my tune on this over the last like week or so that I was completely out on, on James Cook, and um, I'm really glad I got off course there. 
I had a draft this weekend. So we hosted the, the BDG NYC draft weekend where we had 11 of you guys fly out. We had a live fantasy draft in the office. The settings are full PPR. I took James Cook as my RB2 in the ninth round. So it was late. It was late in the draft. Full PPR. I felt very co- uh, good with him. I rewatched, I rewatched every one of these preseason games, by the way, all the starter snaps. So I was busy all weekend, but yesterday, today, we was grinding our teeth, grinding our coffee, grinding our traps, and we got into the videotapes. Now, it's really obvious to me, one, James Cook is just playing an absurdly high number of snaps with Josh Allen. Like, he is a clear RB1 there, and I'm trying to be unbiased here because I need to help y'all. If I keep going on my bias, it's going to hurt everybody involved. James Cook is... Him in the passing game, the number of screens they set for him, the number of plays they have run around him being in the passing game is is eye-opening. Like, it's very obvious to see that that's going to be a big part of what they do in this offense. Um, so James Cook will be a big weapon here. So in PPR leagues, I'm all in. But the worry that we had was what happens when they get down to the goal line, and we saw it. Damian Harris, first guy in on the two, four-yard line, he was getting the touchdown score. He was the one getting the handoff on the goal line. That's the big problem with James Cook. Full PPR, we like him because he's going to get a lot of touches. He's going to get a lot of pass-catching opportunities. On the goal line, not going to score a ton of touchdowns. Even if it isn't Dame Harris, it's going to be Latavius. It's going to be Josh Allen. So James Cook might score. He needs to score long touchdowns, okay? Or they need to get him screen passes in the red zone from like the 15 or 20 and score from there. But his touchdown ceiling kind of feels like it's capped at maybe six-ish for the year. So that is like my hesitation on him. Other side of the ball, Justin Fields played 12 snaps. The backfield was completely split. Khalil Herbert, four. Deontay Foreman, six. Rashawn Johnson had two. Rashawn was playing on third downs. Deontay Foreman was catching screen passes. Though Deontay Foreman did leave this one with a rib injury. I don't believe it's that serious, but I guess it speaks to the bigger picture of they have three good backs, man. Khalil Herbert, I'm a huge fan of. Deontay Foreman's been really, really good and was awesome last year. Roshan Johnson's a dude that everybody loves coming out of Texas. So it will be tough to draft any of them highly. I Even for even for me, a guy that I love, Khalil Herbert, like I think he's one of the best pure runners, um, one of the best underrated pure runners, at least, in the league. I'm not, I'm not really trying to draft him earlier than like the ninth, tenth round because there's a lot of risk involved with this many heads being – in the backfield. It's really the only takeaway from there. Seattle at Green Bay. Seattle rested all of their starters. I will say though, Zach Charbonnet and DJ Dallas played and split work seven to four. DJ Dallas again coming in on pure passing situations and third and long. So this backfield again, like despite high level of talents between Charbonnet and Walker, it feels like they're going to have a role for a pass catching back, whether it's DJ Dallas or somebody else. Really hard to understand or know or have confidence in using an early round pick on any of these guys, despite how talented you think they're going to be. Green Bay, Romeo Dobbs, who has been one of my favorite fucking picks up to this point in drafts, was held out of this one with a hamstring injury, which was the first I have heard of this. So we're going to have to like wait and see on what's going on there. That's a red flag this late in August, obviously. Might have been precautionary. We haven't heard anything about it, but no. Jordan Love looked pretty good in this one. Christian Watson seemed uh, to be about an inch away from exploding. They seem to be about an inch away from exploding every time they're on the turf together. Uh, Christian Watson is creeping very slowly towards that must-draft list for me. He scored a touchdown in this one. They just missed on uh, a deep shot down the field, which feels like it's been the case every single week. Again, seems like Alec Pierce and Anthony Richardson are just the other version of this team here. They're so close to connecting on those deep passes. They're going to happen often in the regular season. Cleveland at Kansas City. Uh, KC rested Mahomes, Kelsey, so we're just going to call that side a wash. Cleveland, we did get to see three drives, 20 snaps from Deshaun Watson in this one. His performance was a little bit shaky. I'm not going to lie. He had uh, a lot of ups and downs. He had some really good throws. He was scrambling a lot. He was you know, running out of the pocket and making shots down the field, which good to see. But he also had a lot of kind of shitty, erratic throws. Regardless, not moving him down the rankings for that. I'm still fine with him as a QB1. Of the 20 snaps, Donovan Peoples-Jones played 19 of them. But we did get to see DPJ, Amari Cooper, and Elijah Moore all on the field together at the same time. It seems like DPJ is locked in to be the wide receiver three at worst. Now, Elijah Moore was pretty much used on three wide receiver sets and some on the outside when they had two wide receiver sets, but it feels like he's kind of going to be the slot guy. And it's kind of unfortunate if they see him that way to just be the slot guy. But my thinking is like DPJ is their three and the role and the roles can't really be reversed where it's like, okay, we feel confident with DPJ in as a slot guy. And then Elijah Moore on the outside, they probably don't want DPJ on the inside. He's a deep, he's a, he's a down the field kind of guy where Elijah Moore it's like he could play both inside and outside, so they might just like exclusively use him on the inside. But I think he's going to be heavily, heavily targeted because he's such a good separator. Uh, the other news to talk about here is that, one, Jerome Ford's been out with a hamstring injury for a long time. So it seems like it was at least a grade two, which is going to linger into the season, and he's pretty much off my board. But they did just trade for Pierre Strong. 
Pierre Strong is really explosive. He was the rookie picked from the Patriots last year in the draft. So you don't usually see sophomore players get traded, but the Browns really wanted him. I think it was a fourth round pick last year. Kid is stupid explosive. Reminded me a lot of Raheem Mostert running. So I wouldn't be surprised if he carves out a role here and eventually becomes the two in this backfield. Not a guy I'm like looking at as a handcuff or anything like that, but I, I think it's worth uh noteworthy that you know in the first few weeks of the season if we see Pierre Strong start to be like the number two behind Chubb and get in for 15 20 percent of the snaps or something it feels like he is probably the right handcuff to hit on that team next game Arizona and Minnesota both rested all their fantasy relevant players we have the battle in the Meadowlands New York Jets at New York Giants they play every week three of the preseason the Giants rested all their fantasy relevant players but the big news here of course is we saw Aaron Rodgers' first action in gangrene and my god Garrett Wilson might catch 150 passes this year you could just tell every every drop back every time he felt under pressure anytime he felt like he needed someone comfortable to catch the ball it was Garrett Wilson Garrett Wilson looked great Rod Rodgers looked okay he was overthrowing a bunch of balls but I think the biggest takeaway here I don't think anyone's like super high on Rodgers but people are super high on Garrett Wilson and after this game I would feel pretty damn fucking good about it behind him like obviously Corey Davis retired shout out to me for that one Alan Lazard still sidelined with like a shoulder injury, supposedly ready for week one. But behind him, like Randall Cobb played eight of the 10 Rogers snaps. Michael Hardman played seven of the 10 Rogers snaps. So it's like there's there's no one else you really want to invest into um, on this offense besides Garrett Wilson and the two running backs in Dalvin Cook and Brees Hall. Cincinnati at Washington, both teams rested all of their fantasy relevant players. Baltimore, Tampa Bay, Baltimore rested all their fantasy relevant players. On the flip side, Tampa Bay. Mike Evans is apparently dealing with a groin injury and has been for a minute. Um, so that is 100% something to monitor. Baker Mayfield played nine snaps in this one, dropped back six times, targeted Chris Godwin on four of them. I have been very vocal about how I think Chris Godwin, Chris Godwin was really fucking good three years ago. Tours ACL last year recovering from the ACL. He was so injured coming into last year and now we're all off him because he wasn't efficient. Of course he wasn't fucking efficient. He was like nine months removed from an ACL tear. Now he's two years removed and he is clear. Like there's no one else. That is a 67% target share. The dude dropped back six times, targeted Godwin on four of them. So I think Godwin's one of the most criminally underrated fantasy picks and drafts right now. If if this is PPR leagues, he's like a rock solid wide receiver too. Mike Evans is more of like a boomer bust guy and again, monitor that groin injury. But if he's out or if he misses time or if that lingers and Godwin's obviously a smash pick it is noteworthy though uh Rashad White played on 100 of Baker Mayfield's dropbacks and he led the team with six routes run so he dropped back six times Rashad White ran a route on all six of them so it's possible that I'm underestimating just how high White's floor is purely based on usage again I'm like still kind of weary that he's not a great runner and eventually that plays itself out and someone else will get involved in the backfield but as of right now, Rashad White moved up my rankings a little bit. Uh, Las Vegas and Dallas, both teams rested all their fantasy relevant players. The Rams and the Broncos, the Rams rested all their fantasy relevant players. Denver rested all their fantasy relevant players, except Marvin Mims played on all 14 of Jared Stidham's 14 snaps here. It seems that he is in line to be their starting uh, slot wide receiver as Jerry Judy is going to be recovering for quite a while from his hamstring injury, and that will probably plague his entire season. Um, so he'll probably be fantasy relevant this year, despite how much I didn't really like him as a prospect. Let's circle back to uh, Miami and Jacksonville, because this might be the longest recap or the, the most I've written on a specific recap. We'll try to get through it quickly. Tua played on 14 snaps in this one, but Tariq Hill played on three snaps. He caught a ball, ran it for like 30 fucking yards, and then got off the field. Jalen Waddle still re uh, recovering from like a core injury. Hopefully he is good to go by week one. Something absolutely to monitor. So we have both of those guys kind of out, but Braxton Barrios has played on 100% of the 11 personnel snaps that the Dolphins have ran in first quarter of the preseason games with the starters this offseason. So it seems like he's locked into the starting slot wide receiver role for this team. And again, like take this for what it's worth because Waddle and Hill were both outs. Uh, Robbie Anderson played on 100% of the snaps outside with Tua, followed by free agent signing Cedric Wilson. I, I, don't, I have no interest in either of those dudes, but Durham Smythe. Durham Smythe played on 13 of 14 snaps at tight end. And this has been the case. He's been playing on like near 100% of the snaps with Tua. And just by default, that feels like it's going to be a valuable spot because they don't have any other pass catchers. It is Hill, it is Waddle, and there's a bunch of scrubs behind him. They use Mike Kosicki. They did use Mike Kosicki. And if they're comfortable with Smythe, he might get a ton of red zone looks. So he might be a nice little value later rounds in best ball because of how much playtime he is going to get. Raheem Mostert played on 11 of 14 snaps. Again, Jeff Wilson has been out and hasn't played any preseason um, I believe Salvin Ahmed got hurt. Devon A. Chain is also recovering right now. So Mostert, for me, 
he, he continues to be the starter here. Feels like one of the sharpest 11th, 12th round picks in fantasy right now. He is a legitimate starter for a very good offense. Maybe he stays healthy for six weeks, maybe eight, but goddamn, if he stays healthy for 17, the value that you're getting there is enormous. Flip side of things, Jacksonville, Trevor Lawrence, 25 snaps, and goddamn it, was this offense looking pretty. Calvin Ridley played on 84% of the snaps, Zay Jones on 80%, Christian Kirk on 65% of the snaps, but all of them were heavily involved in the passing game. Again, what I will relay here is Calvin Ridley, every time they step out on the field, looks more and more and more like the alpha here. I It looks like he's got no rust on him. This dude was not left out in the rain. He was taken care of. He was in a cool environment, somewhere from 65 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit kept locked away dusted when the maid came into the house because Calvin Ridley he's he's on the precipice of a major breakout season I wouldn't look too much into the disparity between the snaps of Zay Jones 80 percent Kirk 65 percent uh they were both playing uh in 12 personnel some on the outside Kirk would go on the inside and slot wide receiver routes when it was 11 personnel but they had they had a couple funky route or funky personnel groupings that they ran on run plays where Zay Jones played and Christian Kirk didn't so most of the disparity or the the delta between their playtime came on run plays. The ground game was dynamite, and it was completely split up between Travis Etienne and Tank Bigsby. Travis Etienne played on 64% of the snaps, Tank Bigsby on 36% of the snaps. They were working in tandem, flawlessly, moving the chains, moving the chains, moving the chains. And I think that like 65 to 35 split is probably what we can expect throughout the regular season. Now, Etienne took 100% of the snaps on third and fourth down, so it seems like he is probably their passing down back. Uh, short yardage situations he was in on it they both did like Bigsby operated as the bruiser he, he'd come in on first and 10 run up a chunk fucking run someone over be second and four after that that was what his role was both of them got work in the red zone tank Bigsby got a carry really close to the goal line and fumbled it away lost the fumble so that could be a little bit detrimental to him I think they're both going to be very usable in fantasy this year but ETN I think ETN will have monster weeks but his price range where the summer started at like the back of the third now early fourth I'm having a little bit of trouble getting behind that just based on how much split he has given away to Tank Bigsby, but I like both of the players a lot. And let's move to the last game of the week, which was last night. We had Houston playing at New Orleans. New Orleans rested all their fantasy relevant players, but we did get to see CJ Stroud once again suit up, played nine snaps in this one, was named the week one starter officially. So if you're in a league that starts defenses, special teams, Baltimore Ravens, pick their asses up for week one and stream them. They are 10-point favorites against a rookie quarterback. It's going to be big time. Once again, of the nine snaps that C.J. Stroud played in, Damian Pierce played on all nine, 100% of the snaps, third and long, fourth and long, fucking short yardage, long yardage. Didn't matter. Damian Pierce is him. Damian Pierce is the single best pick in the fifth, six rounds of draft. He continues to be bunched with a bunch of lower tier dudes. Pierce is going to explode this year. And we have a little bit more out of the receiving group now, okay? It seems that Robert Woods and Nico Collins are the guys. They played 100% of the snaps with C.J. Stroud. Noah Brown seemed to be like the third wide receiver here, but I do imagine that the third wide receiver will be kind of a rotating door between him, John Mechie, Tank Dell, depending on what kind of like down and distance and situation they're in and everything like that. But it seems like Nico Collins and Robert Woods are both worth taking a look at in uh, the later rounds of your drafts. Obviously, Nico Collins comes with way more upside than Robert Woods. I think Robert Woods is like a decent like wide receiver four-ish in full PPR type leagues because he'll probably get a decent amount of targets as one of those like veteran safety blankets. So there you have it. The week three preseason recap write-ups are officially in the novels. And that is the last recap that we have to do because there are no more preseason games. We've got Detroit. We've got Kansas City on September 7th, Thursday night. So if you've got drafts coming up between now and then, do yourself a favor and cop the draft guide. All right. One of two ways. Again, full price on BDGE.shop. More than half price, like 65% off if you go through Underdog Fantasy and you use promo code BDGE. When you deposit $10 or more, they should email you the draft guide within about 60 minutes. If you do not see it, check your spam folder. A lot of times it ends up there. And if you still don't see it, email us business at bdge.co and we will take care of it for you. I love you guys. I will see you tomorrow. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you're new, hit the button that looks like this as well. If you enjoyed, goodbye. Wow.